presence this morning. It's always good to assemble with the saints. Looking forward to the day when following the resurrection, the end of all things material and time is no more. To be in a glorified state with our Father and all the hosts of heaven forevermore. Someone has said this is just a foretaste of glory divine. When we can assemble according to the Lord's will and shut out the affairs of this present world and concentrate on the worship of our God. It is highly important that we recognize, as we just sang in the last psalm, there is just one way to the pearly gate. That's made very clear in Ephesians chapter 4. But as we go out to try to reach people with the gospel, even as it was as people came to us to love us and show us the way of righteousness and to show us the plan of salvation, we must note the cost of discipleship. We're living in a world that is far more caught up in general and all the institutions of our society and worldly things than we have been in my lifetime. Now, there's always been wickedness, always will be. But there was a time when the government and such like bolstered up basic principles of morality. And so it was in the homes and the schools and other places, but that's not the case anymore. For years now, the home has been a broken institution, speaking, of course, in generalities. As I've said, most of my preaching career, if there is a need to restore ancient, pure, primitive New Testament Christianity, there is a need to restore the home as God would have it. And it's on a sad state nowadays. Even homes where you have a husband and wife, and it's a Matthew chapter 19, 6, God join undefiled bed marriage. It's authorized by God. Then you've got breakdowns in the roles of husbands and wives, the responsibility of parents in the rearing of their children and what they're supposed to do. When it comes to the church of our Lord, there's less and less of an appreciation for the authority of Jesus Christ and the words of the New Testament on anything. Someone, and I read this yesterday, has said, and I've known it for a long time, I was interested to read it, and the person was not a member of the church. But they were talking about we live in an age that accepts things whether there's proof that it's true or not. And that's true. If I like it, that's fine. There's no distinction made between what I am saying that I like or my opinion and in what God said in His Word. I engaged some time ago in a written discussion with two or three people. No matter how much scripture I quoted, no matter how much reasoning from that scripture I did, every answer was, well, I don't like what you said. And even when I called attention to the fact, don't you see this is not coming from me, but it's coming from the Bible that even you say is God's word and you must follow? Well, I just don't think that way. I, just, I got those kind of comments over and over again. So I finally ended the discussion by simply quoting scripture, there is a way that seemeth right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. And it is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. That's why we have the Bible. When we sit down to discuss the truth of becoming a Christian with someone, we must cause them to consider the cost of discipleship. What does it cost to become a Christian? What does it cost me personally to serve God faithfully? What does it take for me to go from earth to heaven? That's very important. Look at Luke chapter 14, verses 25 through 33. And there went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them. Now that, that's an amazing statement. Great multitudes. That sounds good. What does that say about the people? That so many would come together. Great, not just multitudes, great multitudes came with him or followed him. Well, it's almost like, do they really want to follow me and all that follow means? Because he turns unto them 
and says, and my, this is not good on the how to win friends and influence people <laughs> position. If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Now you know that hate there means love less. It doesn't mean hate as we normally use it today. It simply means you've got to love God more than anything else on this earth. And that's the first commandment, remember. That we are to love God with all we are and all we have. And the second commandment is likened to it to love our neighbors ourselves. But well, that's some comment to all these, not just the <coughs> multitude, but great multitudes that followed him. Verse 27, he continues, and whosoever, whosoever is as broad as the human race, doth not bear his cross and come after me, cannot be my disciple. Now you must remember, if you could study some history of those times immediately preceding, well, in fact, many years preceding, right up through that time, that the cross was not something you wore as an emblem about your neck. Or it was some sort of crucifix encrusted with jewels. The cross in the mind of that person was a terrible thing. It was the most shameful, ignominious, horribly painful death that one could suffer. And yet he says, do you think I'm great? You're following after to hear my words? You're calling me the Messiah? Here's what it's going to take of you. This we need to get over to people. Why? How many people do you know or you are around who are living with a man or a woman? They're not married. They don't think a thing in the world about it. Their conscience does not bother them. How many girls are pregnant outside of wedlock? How many men and boys brag about all the girls they've had? And all of that is out there. And the church is commissioned to preach the gospel to every creature. How many people are out there more and more if they're not practicing homosexuals saying it's all right, I wouldn't do it, I think it's terrible, but I'm not going to tell them they're wrong. I'm not going to tell anybody they're wrong. You see, the greatest wrong you can do is to tell anybody they're wrong. Which, of course, is self-contradictory because you told somebody they're wrong. If you're telling them they're wrong because they tell folks they're wrong. But sin's always contradictory. Self-destructive. Blinds a person to an honest heart and logically speaking. But we're commanded as the church to be the light of the world. How is that possible? Well, I live like the Bible says. Well, does that mean we say nothing against these things? Does that mean we don't try to bring people's minds to that? <clears throat> Yesterday we were door knocking. And this happens to all of us that go regularly door knocking if you've gone very much. A beautiful day, beautiful neighborhood. And the lady was working in their little flower bed there and just had beautiful pansies. And I walked up to her and she's a very polite, nice lady. And I introduced myself and my wife and told her what we were there for. And she said, oh, I've got enough of that kind of stuff. Besides that, I'm too old to change anyway. Now think about that for a minute. Do you want to talk somebody like that with that state of mind, that attitude, because they're a good friend is to be baptized so you can be with them? Do you think they're converted? <laughs> See, we don't live in a world that believes in conversion. <coughs> But you'll never be converted if you don't count the cost of becoming a disciple of Christ. When you're studying with somebody and you find out they're in a marriage contrary to the teaching of the Bible, what do you do about it? Do you try to draw their attention to the fact they're in a marriage that is immoral, that is contrary to God's will? What if you're studying with people who are, they're so involved in using foul language they don't even know they cuss around you? even as you're trying to have a Bible study. There are people like that all around us. And on and on you can go. 
Do you think that person needs from the heart and all that he is or she is to consider the cost of discipleship? Notice what Jesus continued to say. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he has sufficient to finish it? Notice how he's appealing to common sense and everyday activity for their day and time. Lest happily after he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him. In other words, in everyday activities, you have to sit down and decide, do I have the wherewithal to start this thing? Or if I have it to start it, do I have the wherewithal to carry it through? Did you see on the news where this hospital just closed? It's just a few years old. It went bankrupt. You know, when you see something like that, you don't have to know all the facts in the matter to know that somebody didn't have the capital to carry through. Because you see, you can have the capital to buy something, but do you have then the capital to operate it? Uh, you, you, you usually use this kind of thing. Well, they live from paycheck to paycheck, or they're operating on a shoestring. What do all those things mean? Somebody did not count the cost. So in everyday things, we must count the cost. Are we able to buy a house, or must we continue to rent? Well, I would like to have this car. I've looked at that thing for years, and I would like to have one. But, now here's the two conclusions you got. Just can't afford it. Usually we say, right now. Because that love of it is still there. Or we say, well, if we do this, and if we do that, if we do this, and we cut here, and we cut, I think we can go ahead and get it. See, that goes on all the time. So the Lord appealed to the people of His day and the very things they did every day and said, but the same is true when it comes to being my disciple. Do you really want to be a true learner, follower of the Lord and put into practice what I'm teaching? Notice saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to make war against another king sitteth not down first and consulteth whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000. Or else, while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassage and desireth conditions of peace. Now watch what he does. So likewise. We'd say, just like that, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Now people read that and say, well, immediately I must give up everything. No, it's a state of mind. It's an attitude toward Christ that whatever is required of Him for me to do or not do or how to do it, I'm willing to sacrifice it. That doesn't just mean automatically when you follow Christ, you give up everything in the world, but it means that you're willing to give up whatever it takes. That's made up in mind. When a person goes down the watery grave of baptized to be baptized for the remission of sin, the water of grave of baptism. That person better have made up his mind that whatever I am and whatever I have from here on out, it belongs to God. I don't know where I'll go in my growth and knowledge of the Bible and what it is to be a Christian, but he would never ask of me anything that's not designed to get me from here to heaven because he loves me. And how do I know? He gave his only begotten son to save me. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be. He's not able to be my disciple. Salt is good, but if it's lost his savor, wherewith shall it be seasoned? In other words, in that day and time, salt wasn't too refined. You had grit and everything else in it. And once the salt was uh, gone, it's nothing but sand left. And it's neither fit for the land nor yet for the dunghill, but when cast it out, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. You have the ability I gave you to understand, now understand the words I gave you. He meant what he said, and he said what he meant. A religion that costs nothing is worth nothing. A religion that costs nothing is worth nothing. Our first point, what does it cost to be a disciple of the Lord? Now you have to ask that and make it applicable to you personally. What does it cost me and the things I want to do? Now remember, you only have one lifetime to do it. 
And you know how long that's going to be. James was joking with me the other day, James R. Line. I, I do remember things when they're several weeks old. So I told somebody the only thing wrong with David, he's old. I didn't respond, but I was too nice to him one of the time. Don't you wish you could live to be as old? Maybe he does. James like to die right now. What about anybody here? Think about it. Jonathan? You're considerably younger than James. He's an old man, isn't he? <coughs> ready to die right now? Well, you can say you're ready in the sense I'm faithful, but are you ready to leave this world right now? There are multitudes of people in the age of every one of us in here that will not be here tonight. And certainly won't be here tomorrow morning. It's appointed unto men once to die. And after that, the judgment, Hebrews 9, 27. In Luke 14, 33, So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Is, the Lord, is, that, is that hard to understand? You give, our, you give your time over to this and to this, but when it all comes to the end, you're not going to take it with you. Paul says, we brought nothing into this world, and certainly we're not going to take anything out. Matthew 6, 33, how we need to put that into practice. Matthew 6.33 in this passage above us, Colossians 3.17, they're so important. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Do you realize Christ is saying that service to me must come before food, clothing, shelter, anything else? That putting all these things before the kingdom of God shows really little faith in Christ and his words. Matthew 6 and verse 30. A scribe said to Jesus, Master, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. Matthew 8 verse 19. Well, the Lord met him with another one of those very bold statements. The foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. Matthew 8.30. How many people right here are in that boat right now? None of us. See, the Lord knew perfectly, flawlessly, the relationship he ought to have with this passing world. In Matthew 8.21 and 22, And another of his disciples said unto him, Lord, suffer me first to go bury my father. But Jesus said unto him, Follow me. And let the dead bury the dead. i got a whole sermon I'm going to preach on that one, so I won't say much about it. Let the dead bury the dead. Remember, let has the form of a commandment. Let those separated from God and who care for this world take care of the affairs of this world. You concern yourself with the work in the kingdom and being like the Bible says you ought to be. But we don't. And for that reason, we get anxious and upset over all sorts of things going around us. Because you see, all these things happening today have only happened in our lifetime. In the history of the world, that kind of thing has never happened before. Only now. Isn't that ridiculous? In Philippians 3, verses 7 and 8, Paul writing to Christians said, But what things that were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. Is that attitude in you? Are we cumbered about the things that the people of the world are burdened with who have no hope of heaven, don't think of heaven, don't think of heaven or hell or judgment? They don't think of the Bible. Ask yourself the question, what is the difference in me and my neighbor who's not even a Christian and maybe doesn't even think of God? What's the difference? There ought to be a difference, a signal difference. Next point is, it costs loving one's own life less than one loves God and His will. People say, I love God. But that's not really the criteria. Do you love His will? 
If you love God, you see you love all the things that are of God. You love all the things that are of God. <laughs> Fruitless to say and ridiculous. It's contradictory to say, oh, I love God with all that I am. But now, wait a minute. Uh, he said this here. Uh, it just doesn't sit quite well. And like some of those people I mentioned earlier who don't accept the Bible any more than my opinion or they make the two equal. How do you reach them if they don't make a distinction between human thinking and the Word of God? He that findeth his life shall lose it. And he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. Matthew 10 verse 39. Are these uh, outdated messages we've studied so far from Jesus? Do they not find application in your life and my life today? If any man come to me and hate not or love less his own life also. Luke 14, 26. Now, you know, I'd like to think all of us think pretty highly of our lives. But Jesus is saying that if you think more highly of your life than you do faithful service to me, heaven's not going to be your home. And the people round about us, if ever before, as the church spreads the gospel and defends the faith, need to be confronted with those truths. Yes, sometimes the church is not as numerous, that is, there's not as many people in it, in the headcount region, as at other times. Sometimes that's because the church is not interested in taking the gospel to people. Other times it's because the people aren't willing to give up or take on whatever's necessary to obey the gospel and live faithful Christian lives. I've often wondered what went through Noah and his wife, and Shem, Ham, and Japheth and their wives when they're the only ones that were in the ark. Only ones out of hundreds of thousands of people. Was it their fault? Or had the people reached the stage to where they weren't interested at all in godly things? And I have to come to that second conclusion because God only judges people when there's no hope for them ever changing. And when there's an ample opportunity to change, it wouldn't. Many are willing to use and even die for the cause of liberty. Have you ever noticed how many people are so upset over the Constitution and our way of life and their government? They don't seem to be concerned about the church. Christ loved his own life less than doing his Father's will. In Luke twenty two forty two, 42, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. I suggest that if you can keep that disposition of mind all the time through the ups and downs of life, you'll be doing very well. And a great example is given to us in the first martyr for Christ, Stephen, in Acts 7, 58 through 60. When it said he went to the synagogue of the Libertines, uh, the freedmen, it says in one version, those, that was the synagogue where all of those Jews assembled who were not Judeans or Galileans. They were from, uh, they would be called the Hellenistic Jews. Now, why was he there preaching? Well, he was one too. Stephen is a Greek name, Stephanos. He went to preach the gospel to those of his own people, his own race, those who were like him. One example for us, he gave his life to preach to them. Even dying as the Lord died, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And we're certainly told, as most of us know in Revelation 2, 10, be thou faithful unto death, and you'll receive a crown of life. It's not get old and fade away and die. It means... If you're 20 years old and standing up for the Lord costs you your life, then you're going to lose your life because you're not going to deny the Lord. Then the next point we want to make is that it costs self-denial. Now you see they overlap. It costs self-denial. Whosoever, said earlier, broad is the human race, whosoever will come after me, Christ said, let him deny himself. That's a biggie, folks. If you can ever get to where you can deny yourself and put God first in obedience to his will, you'll have a lot of things lined up like they ought to be. Notice, deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Well, that's kind of hard to do when you don't even know you have a cross. 
A cross is a painful thing. A cross is a shameful thing. A cross brings about death in the most terrible way. And yet members of the Lord's church, if we are his disciples and faithful to his cause, have a cross to bear. Well, you say, I've never lifted a literal cross as if I'm going to be nailed to it. Well, what did you think in your mind when you first were confronted with the gospel that God was going to require of you when you were baptized into Christ for the remission of your past sins? Galatians 3, 27, Acts 2, 38. What did you think? Did you think then, well, the devil's going to leave me alone now. I'm a child of God. Well, if anything, he's zeroing in on you. He's got the best scope and those crosshairs, that little dot's right between your eyes. The Bible teaches us so clearly that the devil as a roaring lion goeth about seeking whom he may devour. It's that simple. Does he ever stop? No, he doesn't. Who wants you to be in hell? The devil. He can use anything in this material world to draw you away from Christ. Self must be dethroned. And Christ must be enthroned. So the Lord in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John did a lot of teaching on the state of the heart, the attitude of the mind, the mindset. And a great many people, though it has nothing directly to do with transgressing God's law, are in misery because they're trying to make the whole world conform to self. You ever heard of self-will? And, and you never do. You can't do that. Self must be brought low. And Christ's will enthroned and exalted. In fact, our Lord set the example of self-denial. He said, for ye know... or." or rather Paul did, ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. 2 Corinthians 8, 19, or 8, 9, chapter 8, verse 9. <coughs> I don't, we always talk about, and rightly so, the Garden of Gethsemane, the cruel trials and scourging and crucifixion. But can you even imagine what it was like for him to leave heaven and come to earth? And he didn't even come as a, as a rich, wealthy, powerful person. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery, a thing to be grasped and held on to, to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant, was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. Why is that in your Bible written to members of the church, not to those outside the church? Why is it there? What message is he saying to us? Philippians 2, 5 through 9. How far do you go with this business? Well, in 1 Corinthians 8, 13, in a day of idolatry and when they worshiped idols by offering sacrifices, then those converted out of idolatry had trouble getting all that straightened out in their minds. And Paul said, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while, he, while the world standeth. Because he didn't want to cause his brother to be offended. They were weak. They had not the right knowledge. 1 Corinthians 8, 13. There's nothing in the Bible that says God expects them to always be weak. But there are. And what is your concern is one who's stronger. One who knows more than they do. Not to cause them to stumble. Now, uh, Paul reasons, meets, meets, meet. We know that, but he doesn't. And he's turned from idols. And if he sees you meet offered to an idol, then he's, he doesn't understand. Very hard for us to understand that today because we don't live in a society like a society like that where there's actually idolatrous things going on, and meat actually offered to idols, people doing it thinking these are gods just like we think of Jesus and the Father. 
But the church is amidst all that, preaching the gospel. People are being converted. So you've got to walk cautiously. You're concerned about the other person and not that you have the right to do this. I promise you, the church today, many in it destroy themselves because you're not going to tell me I don't have the right to do that. But Paul says you don't have the right to do this. It's nothing to me. Meat's meat. If it's cooked right, I like meat, eat it. And that's what they did offering meat to idols. When they offered it, they cooked it and sold it to people to eat. Paul says you've got to be careful about that as a Christian. Lest the person who's weak and doesn't understand that meat is just meat and you can eat it, that he still attaches that meat off to that idol as an item of worship and gets confused when you partake of it. In 1 Corinthians 8 and 9, but take heed lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. In other words, they don't understand, so they see you eat that meat, and they think, well, I can do that too. And so I go out and actually commit sin because of the liberty you have on the basis of what I know. Now, how do you bring that down to us and living the Christian life? You're mindful about what other people think. Well, I'm just... You know what we're mindful of? I want my way and I'm going to get it. And if I have a right to have it, don't you tell me I can't have it. Or we'll go to fisticuffs over you. And, and I'll just have to break your legs. Since you're a Christian, I'll do it with the Christian spirit. But I'm going to break your legs anyway because you're hindering my, my rights. The next point is it costs daily cross-bearing. I told you these things overlap. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. Matthew 10, 38. Then in Luke 9, 23, and he said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. It has been my sad experience over the years that many in the church, when it came to having to choose between what they wanted and what was good for the whole church, chose what they wanted. I don't see any different a lot of folks. You watch the people going to war and causing trouble in the church. Usually it's over what I want. I've got the liberty to do it. You're not going to tell me. Well, you can keep on that route and... Do the same thing with those in hell with you when you die. Because that's exactly where you're going. To take up one's cross means trials and reproaches and dishonor and privation. And giving up things we have a right to do for the cause of Christ. Putting our desires on the back burner while the Lord's desires are put first. Yeah, but I've got to do this. Well, I forsake gospel meetings. I forsake other things that have to do with seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. I could be there, but this is more important. Now, you wouldn't say that because you know you shouldn't say that. That's really what you're saying. You do what you like to do. You have a right to do it, and you're going to do it. And don't anybody dare tell me that I'm wrong, even though I miss services, and even though I miss that, and even though I'm not active, and even though I don't study my Bible, because there's always something else you're going to do before that. And that's getting right down to where reality lives in your life. And that's the reason you can go for years and never even be able to teach anybody the gospel. Our Lord bore His cross with honor. The Hebrews writer said in Hebrews 12 and verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. That's always been an amazing statement to me. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. What? How do you hook those two together? For the joy set before him, he endured the crucifixion. Because he looked beyond the crucifixion to what it would accomplish for all mankind. And thus he endured. Same reason mothers bear children. That's a real pleasant thing. And when you get upset with your husband, you say, I wish you could just go through that. <laughs> but you endure. And when that first baby's cry comes out, all that <coughs> travail, all that travail goes by the way. That's an important point. Keep in mind. 
Even though the preaching of the cross meant prison and beatings and forsaking of friends and privation, they still did it. There are some crosses, some almost unbearable, that all of us must bear at times, Luke 14, 26. I've often thought, and in Texas history, this is so important. You think of those men at the Alamo when it finally dawns on them. We're not getting out of this place. We're going to die right here. And they chose to die. And that was for an earthly thing. But they chose to die. What about us and going to heaven? Luke chapter 12, 51 through 53 is telling about something is the reason a great many people who are very faithful in a lot of ways are going to go to hell. Jesus said, suppose ye that I am come to give peace on earth. I tell you nay, but rather division. For from henceforth there shall be five in one house divided, three against two and two against three. The father will be divided against the son and the son against the father and the mother against the daughter and the daughter against the mother the mother against her daughter-in-law and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. You know what that means in most cases? If it's over matters of what God said one must do to be saved or be faithful, we give it up. Because the family is the most important thing and everybody knows that and on the day of judgment, God's going to give you a pass. Because you stuck with your family regardless of how ungodly they are, were. Because they're your family. Do you know when the church has to withdraw fellowship with somebody because they will not change? They're going to be sinners no matter what. Do you know that person was actually somebody's little girl, little boy somewhere? And was dawdled on somebody's knee and cooed over and was so happy when the people were so happy when they were born? Everybody is in that boat. So which comes first? It just comes down to that. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. 2 Timothy 3.12. And listen, family members can persecute you about as much as anybody I know of. Now what are you going to do when it happens? Christ was mocked and ridiculed, Matthew 27, 29, and we forget that his own uh, half-brothers and sisters didn't even believe on him until after the resurrection. Ridicule, mockery, and evil speaking will often come against us when we refuse to run with the world and a whole lot of that world's in our own family. Our last point. Is being a disciple of the Lord worth the cost? Yes, and then some. If we view it from man's standpoint, however, the cost may be too great. But if we view it from God's standpoint, it seems rather small. You know, God had, from a man's viewpoint of what's difficult and what's not, God had the difficult part. Think about Jesus. Now, he has the difficult part. You think your life's difficult in serving him? He never sinned. Though tempted in every point like as we are. He didn't have to leave heaven, but he left heaven. I don't even understand what he left. Except his glory beyond my mind to grasp. And then I won't ask the question, what does it cost me to be a disciple? Discipleship is of greater benefit and honor than being able to perform miracles. Luke 10, verses 17 through 20. Remember when the disciples came back saying, Oh, look, even the devils are subject to us. Jesus straightened them out. And know the greatest thing is being a faithful servant of mine. The miracles had their place in confirming the word to prove it was from heaven and not from men. But being faithful to God is the key. It's greater honor than being the mother that brought Jesus into the world. If you read Luke eleven twenty-seven. 27, when someone cried out a blessing upon the mother of Jesus, Jesus answered, Yea, rather blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. Now, you can't get plainer than that. So whatever emotions you've got towards your mother and daddy, brother or sister, son or daughter, Jesus said, Blessed are those that hear the word of God and keep it. 
That's a good answer to your friends and your family when they start their antics because they're worldly and don't like it because you're not. Just answer them. You're not, you're not obligated to carry on a full debate with written propositions with nutty people. You're just not. They're, they've got a brain God gave them and they can perceive things if they want to just like you do. And when they don't, it's because they choose not to. Yeah, but you've got to consider this. They choose not to. Look at the judgment and how the Lord meets those kind of arguments. And he doesn't argue with anybody. Have you ever noticed that the judgment? There is not a judgment parable that says the Lord argued with people. Says, yeah, Lord, but we did this. Did we not do that? And Did we not do this in thy name? You ever notice what he does? When they get through with all their did we nots, depart from me. Ye that work iniquity into everlasting fire, prepare for the devil his angels. And then I guess some nut will look at him and say, I think you need to be more Christian. We have, we're so skewed in our thinking, it is pitiful. Pitiful. We close with 1 Peter 1, 4 and 5. Talking about what we have before us. If we consider the cost of discipleship, choose to bear our cross and serve Him faithfully. He says, To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. I like reserved seats. Do you? Who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. When I love the truth supremely, and the gospel being God's power to save me, Romans 1.16, and I'm obedient to it in all cases. I become a Christian when I have believed in Christ, repented of my sins, confessed my faith in Him, and have been immersed in water by the authority of Christ in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit for the remission of my sins. And my Lord at that time adds me to His church. And in that church I serve Him faithfully, having considered the cost of discipleship. Heaven will be my home. The Lord did never intend, He never intended for us to say, well, I don't know whether heaven will be my home or not. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, promise of God, born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Why is that song? Do you sing that song? When you sing it, do you believe those words? And then do you go out and live them? Consider the cost of being a Christian. I assure you that it's worth the cost. If you're not a child of God this morning, we've studied the plan of salvation, what it takes to become one. As a child of God, are you willing to serve Him, putting Him first in every thought, word, and action, and every choice? If not, you need to repent of those sins Come confessing Him and pray God for forgiveness. If you're subject to the gospel invitation, we bid you to come while we stand and sing.